Greetings. I hope and trust. I find you well, my dear friends, and welcome to MS Creative Us. We are starting a new year, a new series, and as we begin, we want to enjoy this moment with you. Most of our students are off campus. They have gone on holiday and will be having them sometime in uh, March, towards April, thereabout. But we are most likely going to be having some uh, students, our master students, coming from Angola. In this program, we are looking at the Sabbath School lesson. And for this particular quarter, we have a very interesting topic, a topic that is quasi-business. And I, I wish to tackle this lesson uh, deriving from the business principles going into those salvific and biblical issues that we need to look at. And our title is Managing for the Master Till He Comes. Managing for the Master Till He Comes. There are some interesting um, issues that already jump out at me as I look at this topic. Managers. Who are managers? Who are masters? This is already business lingo. Now, um, a manager is someone who controls expenses or resources. And the managers would vary, basically. You have um, in your resources category, you could have human resource, you could have financial assets, you could have fixed assets. All these are resources that can be managed. And controlling the expenses has to do with the operations of the entity. But uh, managers go beyond that. We also have uh, financial managers or investment portfolio managers or trustees. These have um, a responsibility to grow this particular fund or endowment fund. So their responsibility is not just controlling but also growing it. So we're going to look at all these facets and say how do they dovetail into our issues of salvation. The other character we find here is the master. Who is the master? The master is someone who has control over, authority over, or directs the operations of another. So that is a master. We've looked at the two um, that are already identified here, the manager and the master. So the master basically has authority over the manager. And the title does not end there. The title goes on to say, managing for the master till he comes. The aspect of till he comes um, basically speaks to contractual language. So till he comes is a suspensive close in this contract. So the manager has a contract with the master and this contract is not open-ended. It is closed, but it does not have a date. It has an event. So when that event comes to pass, then the contract would have expired. So when we say till he comes, it simply means you are on this contract until he comes. So the coming of the master basically um, means the expiry of this contract. But it might not necessarily be just the expiry of this contract. The, the, the manager is going to be given a new contract thereafter. So just to preempt a bit, imagine that earth is a subsidiary of heaven. Heaven is the headquarters. So this particular person has been serving on the subsidiary for a fixed duration. After the duration expires, what the master does is that he then uh, moves uh, the master to, I mean, the manager to the headquarters where he's going to be given higher responsibility, where he no longer is in charge of the local assets, but he moves to a universal scope. So this is what we need to appreciate and enjoy as we go into the study. Our lesson study for this week, basically at lesson number one, we're looking at being part of God's family. It reminds me of that song we used to sing, we are a family. We live for one another and we are a family, a family of God. Children of God, why don't we come together and pray briefly as we join this family of God. Let us pray. Kind and gracious Father in the heavens above, thank you dear Lord for the reminder that we are a part of your family. An enterprise that is engaged in the business of saving souls. And dear Lord, and even improving its own children. Thank you, dear Lord, for being shareholders in this kingdom. May you be with us as we go into your word. In Jesus' name, we pray and we ask, Amen.
as we are looking at the topic being part of God's family, our memory text comes from 1 John 3 verse 1. This is what it says. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Now, if we are to look at this passage, being called the children of God is an act of love from the Father. And the Father, as we have alluded to in the introduction of the whole quarter series, is basically the principal. He is basically the founder of the enterprise. So the rest of us, we are privileged to be part of this enterprise as children, sons and daughters. To be a son or a daughter of the father, already it brings into life inheritance law. So this particular enterprise that is being run is being run for me, is being run for you. So when God says you are my son, you are my daughter, it simply means we have a family trust. And in this family trust, you are the beneficiary. What I have done is to set it up for my children. So God is the principal who sets up this family trust. And you are a part of this family. So as we go through this business principle, we want to appreciate that the author wants us to be as creative in our thinking to the point where we realize that we belong. We belong. We, 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 we are not being given a favor to be here. We belong as sons and daughters. And it is a scenario where we belong by invitation. It is an act of love as in children are born out of love. But it is an act of love in that we come to be part of this family, yet we do not deserve it. So this is something I want us to keep at the back of our minds. As we take off, we are part of the family of God. The second issue that I want us to also take note of is that as we go through this passage, not only are we part of the family of God, we also want to look at issues that arise in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. The whole family in heaven and earth is named after Jesus. Now, here's the other interesting thing that we want to appreciate. Uh, Paul brings us to this appreciation that we bow our knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus. So this is where now we have um, this debate that has gone on for quite some time. Appreciating that while Jesus is uh, given this um, designation of being the Son of Man, the Son of God, it does not necessarily make him the child of God, uh, even though that is not the focus. The focus is the relationship that exists between God as Father, Jesus as Son, both being Lord, Lord as an Adonai, both being Master. So from the business concept, we want to appreciate that if we have two Masters, two Masters, in as much as the Bible says you cannot serve two Masters, you're going to find yourself loving one and hating the other. In a business concept, it makes sense. When you are setting up a company, this is the requirement, unless you, it's a sole proprietor. This is the requirement. If you're having a private business uh, corporation or you're having um, uh, a, a private limited or a public limited entity, the minimum is that you must have two directors for you to set up a company. You must have a minimum of two directors. So if you have two directors, Let's look business. Let's use business legal language here. Director number one of this enterprise is the father. The second director of this enterprise is the son. The third director of this enterprise is the Holy Spirit. Now, as we go to the name of the entity, what is the name of this enterprise? The name of this enterprise is named Christ. So everyone who then works for this enterprise now comes to be known as a Christian. So the naming of the entity gives it legality. The naming of the entity gives it identification. The naming of the entity gives it a philosophy. So when we are looking at the aspect of being part of God's family, we need to appreciate the identity of the enterprise that we're in. 
We need to appreciate who runs this enterprise. So Jesus basically becomes um, the, the visible and active director, while God becomes the silent partner. We don't hear God speaking to us directly as he used to in the past. When you get to the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible is clear that in times past, he spoke to us through his prophets. But now he speaks to us through his son. So this already gives us a glimpse into this partnership. God is the silent partner, while the son is the active partner. Not only is he the active partner, he becomes the managing director. The managing director... Um, becomes part of the day-to-day -day operations I and mean, to the extent that he's submerged in these operations. So when you look at this enterprise, you're going to find that everything revolves around Jesus. Why? Because most likely, God the Father will come at an annual general meeting. That's where we'll see him. So Jesus becomes a manager of some sort. But he is at, um, when you're looking at a managing director, a managing director is at a strategic point uh, speaks to the vision and philosophy of the entity. Thereafter, you may have an executive uh, manager. These would be maybe your CEOs, your chief of uh, financial operations, your chief of operations, your human resources director. Those are managers, but they are at an administrative level. So these, um, what they do is they interpret the strategy so that once it's interpreted, it can then be passed down to those who are line managers for implementation. So look at these strutters to say they are managers here. But when we are managing for the master till he comes, we have one of um, the directors who is active as a manager. So this particular director, because he's active as a manager, he becomes a manager like us. He is responsible to the Lord. He is responsible to the master. He is responsible to the directors of the entity. And he is also a director of the entity. So this is where now um, we, we, we get to appreciate the concept of Christ being fully human and Christ being divine. He is fully a director and fully a manager. So when you talk about employees of the entity, he answers the call because he's a, a managing director. So when we now want to look at directors, he also sits at the table because he's a director in his full right. So when you look at um, the payroll, the managing director appears on the payroll. When you look at the director's dividends, the managing director appears on the director's dividends. Why does the managing director appear on the director's dividends sheet? Because the managing director would have invested capital into the enterprise. So what makes Christ um, sit on the director's table? Because he is God. He has invested into the creation of this enterprise. This is why he sits at the table. And when we look at the element of employees, why does the managing director pick a salary every month? Because he is working every other day. So when you look at Christ, he comes into this relationship and works Every day. Every day he's at work and he comes to appreciate the operations of the company because he's part of it. And um, let us move on to the other interesting point that you're going to find here. I've already mentioned this in passing. God is the owner of everything. So it, it, it's something that may be difficult for us to wrap our heads around. The, the shareholding structure. Who holds the major shares? Who is, is it an equal distribution or it is um, shared maybe at 60% uh, to God, 20% to the Son, 20% to the Holy Spirit? Some of these things are not known to us. Let us just wait until we get to heaven. Maybe we can get a deeper appreciation of the shareholding structure. But what we know from, for our understanding on the operations of this enterprise, God owns everything. Get to Psalm 50 and look at verses 10 to 12. Look at Psalm 24, verse 1. He makes it clear that he owns the cattle upon a thousand hills. Everything that is on earth is his. So the ownership of earth is not in dispute. So as we are becoming part of this um, enterprise, 
we should not um, be concerned that we may have a hostile takeover. So in, in business uh, uh, setups where you have a company that is publicly listed, you could wake up the next day, ownership has passed to the next person. What would have happened is that someone would have purchased all the shares. But uh, in the context of our shares, God says this enterprise that you are part of, I own everything. You don't have that risk. So this gives us the assurance that should we even have these particular shares devolve to the inheritors, it inheres to us. It comes to us. We don't have that threat. So, so, so it must give us this confidence that in as much as it has been designed for us, this company, we can bank on it. We can trust the Father because we have a relationship that runs parallel to the entity. While the entity has a life of its own, God gives us this assurance, you are my son. As long as you exist and this company exists, it exists for you. And then the, th the other thing that we also want to appreciate is in as much as God owns everything, all these resources are available for God's family. And how do they become available for God's family? It is on two reasons, for two reasons. Number one, it is as we look at the role of Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus Christ in this whole mix? Jesus Christ is not only um, a core director. He's our brother. Not only is he our brother, he is also um, the benefactor of this subsidiary, which is earth. So what happens is when Jesus comes over to earth, he comes over to this franchise. Um, you, you know, I'm, I'm allowing my business imagination to get the best of me here. So earth becomes a franchise of heaven. So when you have a franchise, what happens is you run the franchise based on the rules that guide the franchisee. When you have a subsidiary organization, you run that subsidiary organization based on the rules that apply at the headquarters. So when Jesus comes to earth, his presence on earth is then a connection. This is how Paul puts it. He says, through the Son, the Father reconciled earth unto himself. So when Jesus comes to earth, this is what we want to take note of. Um, I, I, I'd, I'd like to just read this verbatim from uh, what the, the, the author says here. Also, when Jesus talked to his disciples about going away, he promised the gift of the Holy Spirit to comfort them. If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. So what we need to appreciate is there comes a time when the ministry of Christ moves from earth back to the headquarters. But as he moves back to the headquarters, we have another director who comes to the enterprise. He assumes the role of managing director. This managing director is not known to the people outside, but known to those who are members of the company, members of the enterprise, and children of this particular enterprise. And as we interact with um, this particular director, we want to appreciate that it gives us continuity of the enterprise. Not only do we get continuity of the enterprise, there is a code that links the headquarters and the subsidiary. I mean, heads the franchisee and the franchisor. And if, if we're running the franchise, the connection that I spoke to earlier, the, the Ten Commandments, they, they become the codes of conduct that define operations at the headquarters and at the subsidiary. So the reason why we have codes, it's because we want to have uniformity of operations. Besides order, we also want to have a governance structure. So for you to really say the headquarters and the subsidiary are the same, it is when you have the same bylaws being applicable to these entities. So a scenario whereby we will have the bylaws 
applying in heaven and not on earth um, it, it is a problem. The reason being, whatever law applies at the subsidiary must come from the headquarters. We cannot have laws being done in the subsidiary entity and ascending to the headquarters. What am I saying in essence? We cannot have a repeal of a bylaw that has been done at the headquarters being implemented by the subsidiary entity. I, I, I work at Solus University. Solus University is a subsidiary of the Zimbabwe Union West Conference of Zimbabwe. It is a subsidiary of the Southern Africa, Indian, Ocean and Pacific Division. It is a subsidiary of the General Conference of the Adventist Church. So there is no way so Lucy can begin to uh, pass laws on how the General Conference should operate. So Lucy cannot pass laws that will undo what the division approved for 2022. So Lucy cannot even say, uh, we are now going to decide when and how the union is going to hold its session or even how much is going to pay for the salaries to the employees. So Lucy cannot begin to do that. If that, that does not work here on earth, so I'm just looking at the codes. There is no way earth as a subsidiary can then say the fourth commandment of the Bible has been nailed to the cross. That is a subsidiary seeking to uh, escalate an appeal, I mean a, 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 a repeal of a law, of a bylaw. We cannot have a scenario where earth determines what happens in heaven. But heaven, on the other end, is the one that determines what happens on earth. And as such, we, we, we then have these responsibilities as members of this family to ensure that there is cohesion of systems. We operate with this kind of an appreciation. It is incumbent upon us to appreciate that a structure that is well-oiled, a structure that is functional, becomes attractive to others to come and join it. So those who come and join um, your well-doing companies, it is as they see the philosophy of that company, as they look at the performance of the workers, as they look at the performance of the entity on the public listing. So how we carry ourselves um, helps us to market the entity. And this entity that we are marketing is a family enterprise. And as managers, we are also given um, an opportunity to grow and, and align our interests with those of the company. When a company invites others to become part of it, what it does is it begins to sell its shares. We, we, we have um, companies that started off being headed by families and they grew. Um, think of in the automotive industry, Ford Company, uh, cosmetics industry, Palmolive Company, um, Dietary Look at Kellogg's. Those were family units that grew. And how did they grow? They became publicly listed. And for them to be publicly listed, basically they invited people to invest in those companies. So this family enterprise that we are in, by virtue of being children of the father, makes an invitation for investors. So we are moving now from just controlling assets. Remember when you have a manager, the manager's role is planning, leading, organizing, controlling. And the fifth one is investing, growing the fund. So this one, we don't usually look at when you're looking at um, management generally in business school. But when you're not looking at finance and portfolio investment, banking and finance, then you're going to appreciate the, and the investment aspect. So Christians are called upon to invest. Why do I say so? Take note of Matthew 6 verses 19 to 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, I want us to take note of this as we wind up. Ultimately, 
The reason why managers are called upon to invest in the enterprises that they manage, it is so that they can have a vested interest in the growth of the enterprise. When you have not invested personally into an enterprise, you are not going to be as committed. So heaven uses the same um, approach. Heaven simply says, if you are to be a manager of this enterprise, invest. Put your money where your heart is. When the company makes a profit, you make a profit. When it makes a loss, you also make a loss. So when we invest in this enterprise called Christianity, we're going to be concerned about soul winning. Because when members do not come into the church, the enterprise is not growing. When members leave and defect and they slide backwards, it means our clientele base is dwindling. When we have areas where the word of God has not reached, we will get concerned that our influence is not at optimum level. So we are going to find it imperative. There is this inner drive for, for, for us to go out and share the good word of God. It is because we have invested in the enterprise. That's why you're going to find um, managers working late. But those who have not invested, your simple employee, they, they, they simply clock in and clock out because they've not invested. So you're going to find even church members who just um, come in when it's time to worship. And as soon as we say amen, they bolt out of that place. Why? Because they have not invested. They have no time to check on others. Why? Because they are not interested in the continuity of the company. As long as they have received a salary, they're good to go. So as members of this family, God is inviting us not only to be um, inheritors of the enterprise by virtue of birth or invitation, but he's inviting us above all to invest. And he says, remember, stocks have crumbled. Remember, economies have tanked. I give you this assurance. Thieves do not steal if you invest here. White collar crime does not apply in the heavenly investment. Moth and rust will not destroy your investment. It is not only assured, it is guaranteed not to be maintained, but to grow and grow exponentially. My dear friends, we have looked at uh, some um, business concepts on managing till the master comes. Let us continue to learn and sharpen our skills as we plan the Lord's work, as we lead the Lord's people, as we organize his events, as we control expenses and pilferage. There are some who are stealing God's children. Control the pilferage. And above all, invest in this enterprise. Just take a, run, a, a rundown. Look at how, as a manager, you have fared in these five. Planning, leading, organizing, controlling, and investing for the kingdom. Until we meet again, may God bless and prosper you. Amen. Amen.